All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm James Ward. I'm a platform evangelist at Salesforce, and the session is about distributed commit logs with Apache Kafka. So let's dive in. So uh, I think I might not be alone in that sometimes when moving into this world of distributed systems, uh, it can feel like I'm this cat just pounding away on this keyboard and really have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I've been doing Java programming for a long time, but traditionally with just a database and a web server, you know, pretty simple stuff. And what's happening now in our industry is we now are having distributed systems thrown at us from all sorts of different angles. Uh, like systems like Spark, uh, our, our systems are really becoming totally distributed. We're moving from single machines to clusters. And so this has been challenging for developers like me to figure out how do I move into this world of distributed programming with all these new things to learn and all these uh, new challenges. Um, so uh, for me, one of the things that made this easier uh, with Kafka was that, that Heroku now has a managed Kafka service. And that's when I started to get into Kafka is when it made it a little bit easier for me to move into that distributed world because I didn't have to think about managing a whole cluster of, of Kafka machines. So, um, so I think that, that there's a lot of talks for, uh, at DevOps about cloud, and I think that it's, it's really a great way for us as developers to make it easier to make that step in. But this session is not going to talk about cloud. We're going to talk about Kafka and, um, and then uh, talk about how we can build these distributed event streams on Kafka. So let's dive in. Um, so first, let's start with a really bad analogy. I, I love bad analogies. Uh, so is anyone here, uh, were, were they building systems when RAID 5 was invented? Anyone? Few people. Okay. So I was I was a sysadmin uh, back when RAID 5 came about, and it was a game changer for how we did data storage. Uh, because what it did was it allowed us to now distribute our data across multiple hard drives and have some redundancy and performance while we did that. Um, so it was pretty game changing for for data storage um, by taking the data, splitting it across disks, and giving us redundancy and performance at the same time. So how this relates to Kafka is I look at Kafka as being like the RAID 5 for event streams. What it is is it's this breakthrough in how we do event streaming technology that really kind of takes some of those ideas from RAID 5. So it's distributed uh, out of the box and it's redundant. So those are kind of the two key values of Kafka that make it unique in this event streaming world is that we get some of these benefits, the distributed and redundancy, without having to make traditional sacrifices that we've had to make when doing event streaming. So, th so that's... Um, that was what, what initially interested me in Kafka, was n having something that was naturally distributed and provided the redundancy. So some of the fundamentals of Kafka is, one, it's, it uses me, uh, messaging system semantics. So this is really important. I think a lot of us are familiar with messaging systems, publish subscribe systems, uh, whether from JMS or, or other places. And what Kafka did that was pretty smart is they used those same semantics around their event streaming. Um, so it makes it a lot more approachable. So a lot of the, the terminology that we'll be using today uh, is, should seem familiar to you if you've, if you've done any kind of messaging system stuff before. So another key part of Kafka is that clustering is core. So with, with uh, kind of first generation uh, event systems, I think that clustering was, was usually an afterthought. And with Kafka, clustering was, was really part of the initial design and architecture for it. And in distributed systems, that's what we need because we need that redundancy across machines. We need, uh, and we need the performance of being able to, to uh, have many machines working on things. And then uh, the, the last fundamental here that's really important is that Kafka gives you guarantees around ordering and around durability. And so that's, that's really important in building these, these modern systems. So let's talk about what, what the use cases for Kafka are. Um, so there's, there's a number of different things that we can use it for. Uh, I've, what I've seen in working with a lot of enterprises is that Kafka is becoming really, uh, it's moving into like wildfire, moving into 
to basically every enterprise. So most enterprises out there are either already using Kafka or are evaluating Kafka right now. Because one, there's so many different things that it can be used for, but it also uh, really solves a lot of the needs that the enterprises have. So let's talk about what those are. So one is modern ETL and, and uh, change data capture. So how many people here have a system that like takes CSV uh, files and batch imports them daily or something like that, batch imports? Okay, so quite a few of you. Yep, so this is very common in enterprise is, is this ETL process of, that's, that's pretty arcane. And Kafka is becoming a replacement for those types of systems, or at least becoming a way to broker uh, that ETL into a more reliable fashion and in a way that can be integrated with from a bunch of different endpoints. Change data capture is kind of a new, uh, newer idea, and this is where we want to capture all the changes that are happening in a system and then be able to take those changes and do something with them in another system. And so Kafka is being used um, very heavily for, the, for both of those sorts of things. The other one um, is data pipelines, or one of the other ones is data pipelines. So with data pipelines, what we're seeing is that we no longer have these simple systems where I've got my web server talking to a database. We have all sorts of different systems that all need to share data and access the same data and move that data through a pipeline. And so there, there's all sorts of great talks here about, about data pipelines. Um, and so, so one of the use cases of this is I'm taking data, it's coming into a system, but then I need to send some of that data over, or maybe all that data over to a Cassandra system. I need to send some aggregates to a Postgres database. I need to send some other data to a NoSQL database. I need to plug in Spark for, for uh, being able to do data analytics. I need to be able to do machine learning on top of all this. So now we're moving into this world where we've got these Lambda architectures and we've got all this data flowing through the system and all these things being wired together and Kafka is, be, is very heavily being used for these data pipelines now as being the, the, the system that can handle all the different integrations and, and pipelines across those. So then the last one, probably one of the most common use cases for Kafka is for big data ingest. So this is providing an endpoint where your, your IoT devices, your analytic data, your event uh, data from your apps and from your websites can all be published to a, a Kafka system. And then anyone can then subscribe to that and, and then hook it to a data pipeline if they want to do that. But what essentially this is doing is providing a really scalable buffer for this large large volume of data that can be you know, terabytes a day or whatever. So Kafka was created at LinkedIn as a way to solve a number of these problems that, that LinkedIn had. They needed to be able to have a redundant, scalable system uh, for doing the event streaming that their, that their system was doing. And what they realized is that they couldn't do it on the traditional architecture. So that's, that's why they built Kafka. Okay, so that's our, our quick little introduction to, to the why of, of Kafka, but I want to dive into some, uh, some actual details, teach you about some of the, the vernacular of Kafka. So the first piece of information to know is records. So Kafka uses records, and this could also be called a, a message or an event. Uh, so this is the, the actual container that's going to send the information through the system. So records have a name, a value, and a timestamp. So those are the, the core components that exist on, on every record. They're immutable, so they can only be written to you, not, not overwritten. And along with that, they're append only. So when we're sending these records into Kafka, we're only appending to the system. There is no update uh, kind of process. And then uh, last thing about records is that they're persisted across the cluster and also persisted di to disk so, um, so that you're not going to lose these records. Uh, there's different settings that you can set on how long you actually keep the messages for. Most people don't keep messages forever in Kafka. Most, most of the time you'll have like a one week window or a one, one month window uh, for durability. So if you need uh, forever durability, then you're going to use one of those data pipelines to take these records and and shove them into Cassandra or some other data store. Um, but you mo most often will not use Kafka for forever persistence. 
Okay, so this is also known as a log. So uh, all of us, I'm sure, have worked with logs before, and you'll see a lot of similarities between a record and Kafka and a log. So that's why uh, you'll hear Kafka being referred to as a distributed commit log. So the idea is that we're committing, so this is append only, immutable, we're, we're committing these log messages that have a name, a value, and a timestamp into the Kafka system, and we're persisting them. Uh, and, of course, it's distributed. So now here, a, a very messaging system-oriented terminology here is producers and consumers. So if you've worked with messaging systems, definitely familiar with this concept of, of producers and consumers. So in Kafka, um, what we have as a broker is a node in the cluster. So, um, so that's just, just another word for a node in the cluster. And a producer writes messages to the cluster. So they're writing messages to, uh, to a broker. And then a consumer reads records from a broker. So this is actually important uh, because the consumer is not actually being pushed messages. So I was kind of surprised, you know, I uh, have been in the, the reactive world for a long time where we want everything to be push-based, but it turns out Kafka doesn't do push, really. They, uh, the way that you do it is your client will actually ask the, a broker, do you have any messages for me or do you have any records for me? Um, so it's actually reading records from the broker instead of being pushed those records. So that's a bit of a difference from, from typical messaging systems. And we'll learn in a little bit why we do that um, polling read instead of a push. Uh, so Kafka uses a leader follower uh, architecture for, for cluster distribution. Uh, so what that means is that there's going to be an elected leader for a, uh, a given part of uh, Kafka, and we'll talk about those parts in a second. And then there will be followers that then are, are getting the records that are being written to the leader. Um, so leader follower architecture. Okay, so now it starts to get a bit tricky because um, we've, we've got our records, we've got our, our, uh, our producers and consumers, and that's pretty typical with a messaging system. But one of the things that Kafka, uh, and we've got topics, so, so also a very standard messaging system. Uh, we've got a topic that we're going to be able to send messages to a topic and subscribe to a topic. So that's all a very standard messaging system. So what is a topic, though? A topic is just this uh, logical name for one or more partitions. So now it gets a little bit tricky because now we've got this new element into this messaging system that, that uh, is something that is much more distributed system oriented than, uh, than I've been used to. And so with the idea of a partition is that we're taking this topic and we're dividing it into these partitions. And this is where it becomes, uh, starts to look more like RAID 5 is that we've got these partitions. Each of those partitions can be written to concurrently. They can exist on different nodes. And so, um, so now we have the ability to parallelize our message processing, our message publishing and subscribing across multiple nodes. We'll talk more about how that works in a minute. So, and partitions are replicated. So what happens in the Kafka cluster is that the partition will not exist on just a single machine, usually. Um, it depends on your, your replication settings. But usually a partition will actually be copied across multiple nodes. And so if I'm connected to a node and publishing uh, messages to a partition on a node, and that node goes down, then a follower will have all the data for that partition, or multiple followers will have all the data for that partition. And so then a new leader will get elected. And so that um, the Kafka cluster will elect a new leader, say, OK, we're going to now use this leader over here. And uh, we're going to take this follower and make it the leader. And now you can continue writing to that partition on that system. So Kafka is managing all of this uh, partitioning of messages across the cluster and the replication of those, of those records. It's managing all of that for you. So the nice thing about Kafka is that it's really hidden all these details of how it's doing the whole distributed system, the leader, uh, the leader and follower stuff, how it's doing the election when a node goes down. All that stuff has been abstracted from you, and then you just have a really simple interface for, for working with this. 
Um, okay, so partitions are replicated. And then here's where we get into one of the, the values I talked about earlier, which is ordering. So oftentimes when we're dealing with, with event streams, ordering is essential because we really need to know for message processing, especially when you get into change data capture, you really need to know the order of the messages. Um, so ordering is guaranteed for a partition. So across a topic, there are one or more partitions, but ordering isn't guaranteed across the whole topic. It's only guaranteed across each partition within the topic. So there's going to be some trade-offs here. So uh, in the very simple use case, I have one partition, and that makes it really easy. Now I can, I, I can have publishers writing messages um, that are ordered into that partition, and consumers consuming those messages off of that, uh, that partition. So that's, that's a really simple use case, but that has some obvious bottlenecks to it. So if I only have one partition, then I'm really only working with a single node in the cluster. So by hand, uh, that partition will be replicated, so we still have the replication. But to get the horizontal scalability of Kafka, I really need to use more than one partition because that's how I can now use multiple nodes in the cl cluster for both publishing and subscribing uh, to, the, to the messages that are going across that, that partition or across all the partitions. So the, the partitions are what actually gives us the horizontal scale across the Kafka cluster. Okay, so you've been seeing in these images offsets or, or um, numbers in the messages, and those are what Kafka calls offsets. So every message has an offset value, and the way that those work are that those are unique sequential IDs per partition. So the messages, uh, as they come into a partition, are given assigned the next unique uh, sequential ID. So those are only um, uh, these. The offsets are only unique across the cluster or across the partition. So um, you can see in the image there that as writes come into partition zero, they're being assigned new unique IDs. But those same unique IDs would exist in other partitions. So the ordering is only in a single partition. So the consumers uh, are the ones that are actually tracking their offsets. So a consumer, when it's subscribed to messages and receiving messages, it knows its offset or can, can ask for the latest offset. And it's the one that's keeping track of where it is in the stream processing. So some of the benefits of this are replay. So um, I've, I've definitely built systems where uh, I'm reading through, and at some point, uh, something goes wrong in my, my data processing. And in a typical uh, messaging system, I wouldn't be able to say, like, like hang on, I need to, to fix this. Uh, maybe my system that I'm writing to is down or whatever. Um, I'd have to start buffering or something like that. But in Kafka, Kafka is already doing the buffering for me. And so what I can do is I can say, okay, this is the last offset that I know that I processed. So now when I resubscribe to the stream, I can say, okay, let's start back there instead. And so then I don't have to miss all those messages or I don't even have to worry about how those messages are going to be buffered for me. So they're just going to be uh, buffered by, by Kafka. Okay. So that allows us to do replay. The other thing this allows us to do with the offsets is have consumers that are operating at different speeds. So in a data pipeline use case, my writes to Cassandra may be really fast compared to my aggregate, uh, the analysis that I'm doing with aggregates and storing that data into Postgres. So because I might have consumers that have very different, uh, very different performance characteristics, I need to be able to support consumers that are at totally different places in that stream process processing. And so by using the offsets, now I can have different consumers that are subscribed at different points and reading at different speeds through the messages. And this is, this is really important for the data pipeline use case of being able to have many different consumers that are all doing their own thing and doing them at their own speed. Okay, so those are our offsets. So the, the last bit of terminology I want to go over with, with Kafka is consumer groups. So consumer groups, um, what they're doing is they are creating a logical name uh, 
for one or more consumers. So and these are consumer nodes. So if I have a consumer group A and it has two nodes with uh, one is C1, one is C2, I, I have two consumer nodes. But if we look up here, and this would be for a given topic, a single topic, if we look up here at my Kafka cluster, I have two servers. And then uh, each of those servers would have uh, two partitions, let's say. And now if I want to get all the messages across to all four of those partitions, but I only have two consumers, then what the consumer group is going to do is assign two of the partitions to each of those consumers if I only have two. But if I have another consumer group uh, and it has four nodes, then I can get each of those partitions onto each of the nodes. So, um, so and then what, what's happening is that the records are only being delivered once across the consumer group. So when a message gets written to a partition uh, and into a topic, that's only going to be sent to one of the consumers within the consumer group. So it allows me to not have to deal with, with multiple consumers, both consuming, uh, most multiple consumer nodes, both consuming the same message. So it makes that nice and easy. So, and then this also supports load balancing. So it uses load balancing as I described to, to be able to um, manage that load across different nodes. Okay, so now, exciting part, let's check out a, a demo here. Uh, so I'm going to go open up my browser to localhost 9000. This is my very ugly web app. And you'll see that it's connected. Uh, so this is connected through a WebSocket to a Play server. And you'll see that the WebSocket is sending out these messages. So the message, uh, the value on the left is that offset. So this is that sequential ID uh, of each record. And then the, the value on the right is just a random integer. So this is my very boring, uh, simplest thing that could possibly work application to show, OK, I'm hooked up to Kafka. Uh, I'm receiving these, these records that are being written. And we can see the offset and the value. So one of the things that I built in here was uh, to show the replay ability is that I want to be able to hit pause. And so now I've actually disconnected the WebSocket. So my, my consumer is now disconnected from Kafka. And those messages are still being written. And I'll show you how those are being written in a second. Um, the messages are still being written to Kafka. But now my consumer is, is uh, disconnected. So let's now resume. But before we do, let's take a look at that uh, offset ID is 3440. And if I hit resume, and we can look back down here and see that it got all the messages that, that had been buffered in the time that I was not connected. Um, so that was the ability to go back to an offset, uh, the 3440 offset, and then say, give me all everything, start from there and give me all the messages. Um, so, yeah, and I think you may have noticed that there's a little... Uh, what I did is I tracked the last, you'll see there's two of these, three, four, four zeros. And what I did is I'm tracking the last offset ID that I read, and that's where I'm resubscribing at. So that's why we see that in there twice, and we'll see that in the, the code in a minute. Obviously, we could do that differently if we wanted. Okay, so that's that's my very, very simple demo. Let me just show you. This is all running locally in this case. I've got my Kafka server running locally. I have my random numbers worker process that's, that's sending messages to the Kafka cluster. So it's sending those random numbers every half second to Kafka. Um, so, and those are on a random numbers topic. You'll see there. We'll see that in a couple other places. And then my play server is, uh, has, is running the web socket and server the web page and subscribing to Kafka. So that's my, my producer and my consumer uh, app there. Okay, so we'll take a look at the code for, for that in a minute. Um, we'll just keep that running and go back here. Okay, so in order for to talk to Kafka, you need a Kafka client. And there are many Kafka clients out there. So for every system you could think of, uh, for the most part, someone has built a Kafka client for it. Uh, but the official one is for the JVM. It's a Java client. Um, so that's great for us. For most of us, Java and, and Scala and other JVM developers is that now the, the first class citizen for Kafka client is Java. So that's, that's great. Um, 
so as I mentioned before, it's polling based. So the client uh, is the consumer client is connecting and polling. We'll, we'll see um, that a little bit more in a bit. Okay, so before we dive into the code, I have to give a little bit of an introduction to Aka Streams. Uh, anybody here used uh, Aka Streams? Okay, so a few people are familiar with it. So Aka Streams is an Aka, uh, which is an actor system, uh, an Aka-based streaming uh, DSL, essentially. Um, so what it, it's a implementation of reactive streams. So the Aka folks and a number of other people got together, and they defined a specification for reactive streams. And Aka Streams is the actor-based uh, implementation of reactive streams. So that's what I'm using in this, uh, this application to wire everything together and to give me a nice simple programming model around Kafka. So the uh, Aka Streams uses a source and sync um, paradigm. So source and sync are kind of synonymous with publisher and subscriber. So a lot of the messaging system uh, vernacular is used in Aka Streams as well. So Aka Streams has a whole bunch of features. I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but one of the, the features that they tout a lot is back pressure. So this is the idea that if my consumer can't keep up with my producer, I can put back pressure back on the producer. Um, and that works for some use cases and, and for some use cases not, but, um, but definitely could be useful in a, in a Kafka system. Okay, so... Um, the reason, one of the main reasons why I'm using Aka Streams to wire this stuff together is that there's this really great Kafka adapter for, for uh, Aka Streams. So it's just uh, reactive Kafka and really makes interacting with Kafka uh, pretty simple um, and does it all in a way that works well with Play Framework and, and uh, the WebSocket stuff. So we'll see that in the code. Okay, so let's dive into the code and walk through how this is all wired together. So I'm going to st uh, start with the random numbers app. So this is my application that's feeding data into Kafka. So uh, let's just walk through the, the code for this. This is Scala code. I've got a little bit of setup here, but then I get this Kafka uh, class. So let's, let's go take a look at that Kafka class. So the Kafka class has a sync, which is a sync of producer record. So this producer record is one that comes from the Kafka um, Java client. So I'm just, uh, they're just reusing that, that same um, producer record from there. And then the string string is uh, saying that the key type is a string and the value type is a string. Uh, you could make those wh whatever types you want. Uh, my Kafka uh, class here also has a source. And so the source takes a topic and then maybe an offset. And we'll look at that. But then you'll see here it uses a consumer record, which is again from the, uh, the Kafka client, uh, Java client library. And then again, the serialization um, for the type for name and value. Okay, so let's go take a look down at, at the actual guts of this. So you'll see some SSL config stuff in here. I'm not connecting through SSL when I'm running locally. Uh, this just um, is used when I'm running on Heroku because Heroku uses SSL to connect to uh, the Kafka cluster. But in this case, uh, don't actually even use uh, SSL because it's all local. Okay, so then let's take a look at a couple methods down here. So I have a producer settings method, which creates a producer settings. And then again, I've parameterized these with the name and value types for my records. And then I need to give Kafka a, a deserializer for a producer. So this is going to tell, or sorry, a serializer. So this is going to tell Kafka how to serialize the records that I send it, both the, the name and the value, and so that it can uh, obviously persist those. Okay, so then we create a pr uh, producer settings, and I'm reading my Kafka config. Let's go actually take a look at my Kafka config just so you can see some of the config parameters. There's lots of different tuning parameters you can specify here. But for my producer, I have uh, a closed timeout, and then I'm configuring some information for the Kafka client. So what, what I'm, how I'm going to treat acts, uh, retries, all sorts of different, different settings in there. Okay, so I take those settings, and I give it my string serializer for both the name and the value, uh, value serializer, and then I tell it the bootstrap servers. 
So Kafka uses uh, Zookeeper as the way to manage the, the information about the cluster. And so what I'm doing is I'm giving it these Zookeeper URLs. And so that then it can go ask Zookeeper, tell me about all the nodes that are in the Kafka cluster. And that's how it finds the leaders. And, and uh, then um, that information will change if a node goes down or a new node comes up. Uh, but we need to give it some bootstrap servers so that it can discover the initial state of the cluster. Okay, so that's my producer settings. You'll see uh, consumer settings as well. We'll look more at that in a second. And then I have my sync. And here's where I'm using that reactive Kafka library. Uh, pretty simple. I just say producer.plainsync. There's some other different types of producers that you can use. And so this depends on how you want to handle a number of different factors around uh, producing to, uh, to partitions, how you want to uh, deal with that. But in this case, I'm just using a plain sync and giving it my producer settings. So that's my sync, and the sync is where I pour stuff into, so that's where I'm sending my messages to. So let's go look back at random numbers and we'll see how we actually wire all this up. So I've got my Kafka here, that's the one we just looked at, and then I'm doing a source.tick. So in Aka Streams, I always need a source and a sync. So the source is uh, and sync get wired together, and so I need a source that's going to produce something. And so in this case, I'm doing a tick source, and my tick source is... Um, is just every so often doing a tick in the system. So this is my starting, uh, how long I want to wait to start, and then this is how often I want to tick. So every 500 milliseconds, I'm going to do a tick. And the type here of uh, the parameter that's um, generating the tick the, is unit, so I'm not actually using passing anything in. Um, but then I need to take uh, that tick that happens and creates a unit every 500, uh, essentially nothing every 500 milliseconds, and I need to turn that into something. So the way that I'm doing is I'm doing a transform. So every time I get one of those tick events in, in this source, I'm going to transform that nothing into my random number. So this is a function that is now taking that nothing that I generated and, uh, cr and creating a random integer and turning it to a string. And so that's my tick source. So that's how I'm actually generating those, those random numbers. Okay, so I've got my tick source. That's great. Then what I need to do is I need to do a transform on that random number and turn it into a producer record. So the producer record is, again, from that Kafka client API from, uh, from the Kafka team. And you'll see that it has the parameters here again for the name and value types. And then we specify the topic. So that's the named uh, topic that we're going to be publishing these messages to. And then this second parameter here is the value that we're going to put into that record. So you'll see there's some other parameters here on producer record. So I'm using that last one, which is just taking a value. So I'm not even doing a key. Um, there's, there's definitely use cases where you want to put a key into a record, and there's use cases where uh, you don't need a key. So, um, so in this case, just taking that, that random number that was generated and turned into a string and passing that into the value. But you'll see some of the other uh, options that we can specify on this producer record are the partition. Uh, you could also specify the timestamp if you want, and then the, the uh, key and value. So by not specifying a partition, this is actually going to be written to uh, any partition. And so the way that that works is essentially load balancing. So I think it's going to be scattering my, my records across all the partitions that I have in my system. So how would you decide to, to do your partitioning? Uh, this could be done in many different ways. You uh, could do it based on um, each, each web server node that's receiving, uh, that's receiving traffic, receiving some events being published to it from IoT devices or events. Maybe each of those gets its own partition. Um, that may be the way that you do your sharding across the partition. Maybe you want to do it based on what the data looks like. Um, so there's 
all sorts of different ways that you could decide how you want to do your partitioning. But in this case, I'm just letting it be the automatic uh, load, uh, the load balanced method where it's just going to go across to all my partitions. Okay, so I've taken my tick source. I have transformed those random integers into producer records because that's what Kafka needs. And then I have now wired together that tick source to my Kafka sync. So source is those producer records, the stream of producer records, and the sync is that Kafka sync. And then I run it, and so that's what's actually every 500 milliseconds generating a random number, turning it into a producer record, and then sending it to the Kafka cluster, in this case, just the, the, the one running on my machine. Okay, so that's, that's our producer. Obviously, you could wire together any type of producer that you want uh, and, and send those messages in, so, um, so just as an example here. Okay, before I move on, is there any questions about the consumer or the producer code here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, materializer, thank you. So um, there, in Akka Streams, there is this concept of a materializer, and the materializer has information about the, uh, the Akka cluster that it's going to be using, or Akka, um, the Akka actor system that it's going to be using. And so the materializer is what kind of brings all this stuff together and gives it a place to run inside of Akka. Um, so this is typically passed as an implicit parameter, but I specified it manually here. But essentially, that's just telling Akka Streams how to actually run this, this flow inside of Akka or on top of Akka. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions about the producer? Okay. Okay, so let's now move on to the uh, consumer side. So this is a, a simple little play application. I have two uh, HTTP handlers, one for slash, one for slash WS. So the slash renders the web page. The slash WS is the web socket. So let's take a look at the controller. So here in the controller, I have my slash handler that is rendering a web page, and we'll take a look at that web page in a second. And then I have my WS handler, and this one is, is now hooking up the WebSocket to Aka Streams. So let's first take a look at the WebSocket one. So uh, Play Framework uses Aka Streams for handling WebSockets. So because Aka Streams is all about event uh, publishing and subscribing to events with a source and sync, um, that m works really well with a WebSocket because a WebSocket is a bi-directional event stream, right? So um, so this is this is what makes this this uh, pretty easy to wire all this stuff together is that Play's WebSocket uses Aka Streams. So first thing I do in this method is I check to see, uh, was there an offset specified in the request? Um, if there wasn't, then I'm going to start at the latest. If there was, then I'm going to start at the specified offset. So I look to see, was there an offset specified? Then I go to my Kafka source method. And let's go take a look at that one. So down in Kafka source, this is where I'm setting up uh, the, the Kafka source with, with reactive Kafka. So first parameter here is a topic. So the name topic that, that, I'm, uh, that I'm subscribing to, and then maybe an offset. And then what I'm creating is a source of consumer record string string. So then I need to create a subscription. And the subscription, what it does is it bundles together some information about what I'm actually subscribing to. So in the case where I haven't specified an offset, I'm just going to subscribe to the topic. Okay, So I'm just going to, uh, to say subscribe to the topic. And what we'll see up here where we're actually using, uh, creating the consumer settings is that I'm specifying a group ID as just a, a random UUID. So, um, so I'm not really using the consumer groups functionality in this case. So in that case, I'm subscribing to a topic, and it's given it the group ID through those settings. But if I specified an offset, then I'm going to get a subscription to uh, a, an assignment with offset, which is using a topic partition. So I still give it my topic, but then I tell it what partition that I want to subscribe to. And I don't think I mentioned this, but partitions are referred to in integers. So this is um, what I'm subscribing to in this case is the zero 
zero ta the zero partition, um, and so I'm not actually subscribing to all the partitions in this case. And the reason for that is that I am subscribe. I want to start at a specific offset. So this wouldn't really work if I had more than one partition because I'd only be, in this case, subscribing to a single uh, partition. I'd also need to track um, what partition I, need, I want to subscribe to. Uh, okay, but I'm giving it the offset that I want to, to start with. Okay, then I create a consumer.plainsource, and this is from the Reactive Kafka library, where now I give it my settings and I give it my subscriptions, and now I have a consumer that now I, uh, which is a source here is the, the name for that. And so now I have something that's going to give me a way to read messages out of Kafka. Okay, so let's go look at how that gets used here in the WebSocket. So I'm, I'm subscribing to the random numbers topic. I'm supplying the maybe offset if it was specified. And then I'm uh, doing a transform here. So every time we get a message on that topic in Kafka that's delivered to us, I'm going to transform that consumer record into a JSON object. So this is how I'm going to send the data out to my, my client in the browser. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm taking the consumer record offset and the consumer record value, and I'm just putting those into a JSON object. Okay, now uh, what I need to do is construct a flow. So a flow is that combination of a source and a sink. So you'll see that what I'm doing is I'm actually ignoring uh, the sink. So because in this case, my WebSocket is only sh sending data out to the client. It's not receiving inf any information. So WebSocket is bidirectional. In this case, I want to just ignore anything that comes in from the client because I'm not actually using that part. But th what I want to do is now wire together uh, that WebSocket with the Kafka source so that every time a message is received from Kafka, uh, that will be then delivered down through the WebSocket down to the client. Okay, so that's my WebSocket. Let's go take a look at the web page here. So now some fun JavaScript. Uh, so here in um, our app, let's start at the bottom. We've got the, the very basic UI there. We've got uh, a way to, to show us our status and a button to pause or resume and then our list of messages. So now in the JavaScript, here's what we're doing. We are uh, we have some global variables here to track things like the last offset. So we get our URL to our WebSocket. That was just a page parameter that was specified. And then um, if that last offset was not null, then we're going to send that as a request parameter. And that's where that maybe offset gets passed into that controller function that we saw earlier. Okay, then we create a WebSocket. Now, here's the exciting part, is that we have a WebSocket on message function. So what we're going to do is parse the data that we've received from the WebSocket. So every time we get a message from the WebSocket, we're going to parse it as JSON. Then we do a little bit of uh, stuff here to get the offset. So we set the last offset. That's how we're keeping track of where we were in that stream. And then what we're doing is we're constructing a little DOM object. This is like no jQuery, no web framework, just raw JavaScript and HTML. But I'm constructing a, a DOM element and appending it into the DOM with the offset and the, uh, then the, the message, uh, the record value. Okay, so that's why we see those. And then I've got some uh, stuff here to update the status UI. So on open, on close, right? And then on startup, uh, when the web page starts, we set up a few things, connect to the WebSocket, and then have some handling on that button. So that's how that all works. Let's go check it out again. So here we've got still receiving messages. And when I hit that pause button, that disconnects the WebSocket, updates that, that UI. But the messages are still being produced by that random number producer. And then when I go back and resume, now we've just uh, said resubscribe at the offset that I last read. So now remember that uh, this, uh, the way that Kafka works is that there's these partitions. And in this case, uh, you may have noticed because all of these IDs are unique, I actually only have one partition in this very simple use case. So I have my one partition and I'm writing messages to that one partition and consuming messages off of that one partition. So that's not giving us any horizontal scalability, um, but, uh, but 
you can definitely see how if we had if we told Kafka when we cre- you you tell Kafka when you create a part uh, when you create a topic how many partitions you want on that topic so that's the way that you set up the number of partitions um, so now you can see all right if I had created this topic with more than one partition then we could have our producer actually writing to um, to the uh, all of the partitions and then we'd actually be seeing multiple uh, duplicates of these. IDs um, because each partition has its own uh, log, essentially its own sequentially ordered list of, of events. Okay, so that is our code demo. Uh, is there any questions about the producer side of this, um, the source uh, from Kafka and the producer side? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we we would have to if we uh, if we're using consumer groups, then what I've done is I've actually said, okay, my consumer group is subscribed to a topic and load balance the messages across all the partitions in that topic, load balance across them for for my consumer, for this consumer, right? And so in that that's what this one is essentially doing is it's doing that load balancing for the consumer group for me, but in this one. Uh, in this case, where I've specified an offset, is I need to know the offset for a partition. So the offset is specific to a partition. And in this case, I only have one partition, so I'm telling it uh, subscribe to the, the partition zero, right? So if I had multiple consumers that, that needed to know this, I'd have to actually program some logic in here to tell them which partition, or they'd have to know which partition they're subscribed to. So an example of this would be, uh, let's say every consumer is going to get like load balance to a specific partition, right? So I've got WebSockets and they're all uh, connected, but they're all subscribed to a spe- specific partition. I'd have to know that information uh, per client. So I'd have to have the consumer, it would have to know which partition it is actually working with. Um, so there's, those are the, the, there's like the high level API of being a consumer and using consumer group and just having, uh, the delivery happen, uh, easily and not having to think about partitions. And then there's a lower level API where I actually want to start using the partitions directly. So in this case, it's not a good example of how you would use the partitions in a partition data set. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you definitely would have to. So, let's say I wanted to subscribe to all my partitions. Then you're absolutely right. I'd have to keep track of my offsets for for each partition. Yeah, and so my client code would actually be different because I'd have to be tracking for this partition. I'd have to be sending out the partition information. Uh, yeah, so it would definitely become more more complicated in that case. Yeah, but that's one of the things I actually really like about the the uh, Kafka Reactive Kafka library is that it gives me a really easy way to get started. And then as I need more features, as I need like horizontal scaling, I can start to dive deeper down. There's nice escape hatches down into the the deeper levels of of Kafka. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about the producer? Or sorry, consumer. That's a consumer one. Okay, and sorry if I, if you're raising your hand, I can't see everyone very well. Okay, so that is all the code. It is all open source up on GitHub. Uh, I I have a blog post where I go through the very simple version of this. So I created a, a different branch for for the code that, that we just saw um, with the pause and resume. And so that code is on the DevOps branch. So the code that I just showed you. Okay, so we have about ten minutes left for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Slow consumers, yep. Yep, so you have to deal with buffering when you're doing slow. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the key uses of Kafka is because it's doing the durability of messages, it's doing that buffering for you. And so you just need to keep track. Uh, well, in the case of a slow consumer that um, 
you may not have to think about this at all. You're, when, you re, when you subscribe, it's going to take you to the latest message. If you have the potential for that consumer to go down and you need to be able to restart that and do, or do a replay, then you have to get a little bit deeper into the stuff I was talking about with partitions and keeping track of offsets and those sorts of things. Um, but, but absolutely, Kafka is going to make that a whole lot easier because Kafka is essentially doing that buffering for you. Yeah. Yeah. So performance of Kafka. That's I didn't mention it, but the performance of Kafka is phenomenal. They have a bunch of of stats on their website where they've done all these performance tests. Like it's it is crazy fast. The um, the characteristics of adding nodes doesn't degrade the performance. So it's uh, check them out on the Apache Kafka site. But really impressive performance. Uh, I don't know how how they do it, but it's it's essentially like network speed. Is is what how fast they've gotten it? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, another question. Yeah, so Redis does have a messaging system. Um, I think one of the main difference differences between Kafka and Redis, from what I've seen, is that Redis is is usually used um, for for like forever durable storage. Uh, they don't have this idea of okay, we're just going to keep a window of data, whether it's a week or a month or whatever. Um, so with with Redis, uh, from from what I've used it for, is is mostly for like forever durable data, uh, not in that window windowed persistence. Um, and then the other thing that is probably, I haven't looked real deep into Redis clustering, um, but when I did do Redis stuff, it didn't seem like clustering was, was a uh, first concern. Uh, it seemed like it was maybe more of an afterthought added on later. So I don't know how they would deal with like leader follower with partitioning, some of that kind of distributed stuff that, that Kafka is doing out of the box. Um, but for simple stuff, Redis messaging is great. It's, it's super simple. So yeah, good question. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Why are, yeah, so why are the Kafka clients polling? So part of that, I, I think, is because when you, um, when you do a subscribe, you're actually subscribing to a specific offset, right? It's either like the latest offset or, or a specific offset. And so uh, from what I can tell, uh, they're doing polling because this allows them to say, okay, now give me all the messages f since this offset. And then it asks again, like 50 milliseconds later, give me all the messages from this offset. And then again, give me all the messages from this offset. And so as far as I can tell, that because they're doing this offset-based uh, essentially query, um, that it needs to be polling. I think the other aspect to that is that it does uh, allow the the guaranteed delivery where I'm not gonna I'm not gonna miss any messages because I'm doing that offset based polling whereas with push like messages it's it's easy for messages to get lost in a push right because then you have to have a way of doing acts like okay uh, when did you receive the message and uh, when you do push so um, so with polling they don't have to do the the acts in that in that way they just say I've received these offsets now let's let's get the messages from this next offset that sort of thing yeah yeah question Uh, the Kafka client is doing the polling underneath the covers, and then the Aka stream and Ka reactive Kafka library are providing like a nice API layer around around that for me. So they're kind of transforming that the the message polling into a source and a sync, or in that case, into a uh, source, right? So they're transforming that all the un, the polling underneath things into a message source that gets an event uh, every time it has a new message. Yeah. Yeah, you can configure there. There is like like three hundred different config values that you can specify. I didn't actually show that. I can show that real quick in uh, the application.conf. You can see in here my my polling uh, settings for my consumer. So, yep, absolutely, all that stuff is configurable along with all sorts of other things. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Message ordering across partitions. Yeah, so um, 
There isn't anything that I know of that would help you help you to do do that. I think you could potentially use the timestamps. So the timestamps are a, a newer feature uh, in Kafka 0 0.10. And so before timestamps, it was probably really probably impossible to have uh, ordering across uh, all the partitions in a topic. But with Kafka 0 0.10, they added the timestamp into the record. So every record has a timestamp. And so if your time is is accurate right across your cluster uh, then you could create ordering across all the partitions in, in a topic um, but that's the only way I can think of to, to have uh, some guarantees around ordering across the partitions yeah good question okay any other questions all right well thank you so much for coming I hope you uh, learned something and uh, I'll be here uh, if you have any other questions so thank you